Are you guys singing again? Yep, me too. You're listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. I am Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And thank you for joining us. That's right. Today we are starting our holiday bonanza, our Christmas extravaganza. Right. Say our out of control Christmas special. Oh, see, I was hoping you knew a third word that rhymed with bonanza, but uh, our third stanza. Good. I would also have accepted George Costanza. <laughs> You're killing independent George Jerry. Our Festivus from the Costanzas. That's right. It's a Festivus miracle when you get one Doonstief episode. But this time around, there's going to be many. We decided for some reason last year... To, I mean, normally this is a thing that we've been doing for, uh, it's been a few years, I think, where we just write a Christmas story in the month of December. And for some reason last year, we decided, why don't we make this a thing on the Dune Steve? And we asked listeners to give us options, uh, prompts for a story. And a bunch of different people submitted a, a couple of different prompts that we could try. And then we chose one of them. And then you and I wrote stories during December based on that. And then we invited everyone else. Hey, if you want to write a holiday story based on this prompt, go right ahead. We'll give you to the end of January since we didn't tell you until we did our own Christmas episodes and you didn't have time to write them in December. And we got several people who took us up on it. And so we are here to present those stories to you now. And we're... Starting early just to make sure that we can manage to get them all in before Christmas comes and goes. <laughs> because that's more likely than us getting them all in on time, truthfully. Well, see, I'm glad you remember all that because I, I honestly didn't. And I didn't even remember what the prompt was. So, you, so we opened it up to the listeners to give us a prompt and it came from one of them? That's right. Now, one of the stories that we will be sharing... It was the person who came up with the prompt. Wait, was it me? Um, no, it wasn't you. Oh. It was one of the listeners of the show. And I, yeah, when we decided upon his prompt, I think he felt obligated. <laughs> like, oh, great. Now I'm going to have to write a story. So, yeah, we got a, we got a story from him. To, uh, I think it'll probably be our next episode will be the story from the actual person who invented our prompt that all these stories are based on. But yeah, so this is basically the Broken Mirror Christmas event. Oh, shoot. Do I have to find that sound effect? Dang. No. No? Uh, I mean, you can if you want, but I would not be upset if we didn't hear the sound effect every single time <laughs> the word comes up. Of course, it's all up to you. I know you enjoy that kind of thing, so I just want you to be happy. Well, well, th <laughs> what would make me happy right now is if you told me what the prompt was that all of these stories are going to have in common. So all the stories are based on this prompt. You're invited to your girlfriend's slash slash boyfriend. boyfriend family Christmas dinner for the first time. But the meal isn't what you were expecting. That's a really good prompt. Yeah, it's nice and open-ended. My uh, 2019 Christmas story followed that prompt, and my 2020 Christmas story followed that prompt. <laughs> so you were prepared and then prepared. I was prepared and repaired. <laughs> well, so sorry. I mean, we're going to have episode after episode to talk about this. I was going to ask you about your experiences, but. Maybe we should run the story. <laughs> yeah, we probably ought to. We can run the story, and then uh, we can talk a little bit afterwards. But yeah, we do have a bunch of episodes in which we can talk about uh, all sorts of stuff that goes with this. <laughs> so today's story is 
Service with a Smile by Rob Broughton. About the author. Rob Broughton lives in upstate New York where he writes as much as he can manage and eats far too many carrots. Service with a Smile is his first published work, assuming you don't count Nintendo and Hasbro trading cards, which pretty much no one does. And now, on with the story. Service with a Smile by Rob Broughton I lowered my car window and watched the gas station worker. I had parked under the full service sign, but he was still just sitting there, staring out at Route 206. You can't pump your own gas in New Jersey. That much I knew. Was I supposed to honk? I sighed and turned off my car instead, about to head inside and buy a soda to ask for some gas and directions. Luckily, I didn't have to. As soon as the engine stopped, the employee stood up. He walked over to my car, and as he got closer, I saw how blank his expression really was. He was probably in his forties, except he carried himself like my seventy-year-old grandpa. I guess twenty years of pumping gas would drain the will out of anyone. I plastered on a smile I didn't really feel. Who could blame me? I'd been driving around lost for a half hour on Christmas Eve in a place like Shamong, New Jersey. Meeting your girlfriend's parents for the first time is never fun, let alone showing up late. I called out to him as he approached. Hey, can I just get some regular? He didn't react until he was standing at the car window. He bent down, and only then made glassy eye contact. How much? he asked, voice monotone. I thought about my bank account before answering. Twenty. Cash or credit? It was more of a robotic statement than a question. I had no idea someone could be that unenthusiastic about gasoline. Credit, please. He took my card without comment and walked back toward the gas tank. I looked at the little convenience shop inside the Exxon station and hoped that there was someone, anyone, inside. A person who might help me out with directions better than this zombie. No such luck. I fished two dollars out of my wallet for a tip. Maybe that was enough to earn an answer with more than three words in it. The guy thrust my credit card about two inches from my face, and I jumped. I held the cash out toward him. Thanks, I said, waiting for him to take the tip first. All I got back was a grunt as he took the bills. I put the card into my wallet and said, So, I'm a little lost. He turned around and walked away. There went two bucks well spent. Uh, Listen, I I just need to find Rampart Lane. It's not even on Google Maps. He turned back to me, eyebrows raised. You're looking for the Herbert family? I nodded. Yeah, uh, how'd you know? The guy's face split in a smile that reached all the way up to his eyes. They're the only folks out on Rampart Lane. He briskly walked back to me and squatted down, holding his hand out. Welcome to Shemong, sir. You can call me Reggie. All my friends do. Uh, thanks. I hesitated to touch the calloused hand that had been shoved through my car window. Things had been less weird when he barely tolerated my existence. Worse, I didn't have a clue why he was sucking up to me, unless my girlfriend's parents were big shots around town. Mary was going to pen law, but she was smart enough to go there. I'd never wondered if she was going to an Ivy League school because she was a congressman's kid or something like that. I reached out, and Reggie gave my hand a firm shake, his palm scratchy against mine. I'm Tommy. Reggie beamed at me. Nice to meet you. The handshake definitely went on a little longer than strictly necessary. He ended it to point down the road. Now, what you want to do is go south down 206 a mile, take a left on Forked Neck, and then right onto Bard's Bridge. Rampart Lane is at the end. Thanks. That helps a lot. I raised my window, eager to be on my way, and not just because I was running late. Have a good one. You too, Thomas. 
Reggie said, right before my window closed. Only my grandparents and elementary school teachers called me Thomas anymore. And apparently Reggie, who energetically waved to me as I got back onto Route 206. I rolled my eyes and pretended not to see him, so I wouldn't have to wave back. At least Reggie was good at directions. Bard's Bridge Road started with a few houses opposite an empty field, transitioned to empty space, then entered a lightly wooded area with trees on either side of me. Just before a dead end, there was a left turn that led into the trees. Unlike all the other green and white signs in Jersey, Rampart Lane was written in gold lettering on a gray background. Mary's mom had told me one Rampart Lane based on their novelty driveway sign? No wonder Google hadn't helped. Wow, I muttered. I turned onto the so-called lane and drove under the shade of the trees, the shadows deepening under the setting sun. I crept along at about five miles per hour, and the longer I went, the more worried I got. A long driveway probably meant an expensive house. I hadn't packed any clothes, and my black jeans and button-up blue shirt suddenly didn't seem like enough. I was surprised to find a modest two-story home in a clearing large enough to let the last bit of daylight shine down onto it. It was slate gray with white frames around the front door and windows, the driveway curling around into a small circle right in front. I hardly noticed. Most of my attention focused on the amazing lawn. I had only seen hedge art like that in movies. There was a dragon taller than me roaring at a knight with a sword and shield, a unicorn pawing at the air, some sort of fairy queen, and another five or six more. The hedges and grass were still bright green, even this late in December. I followed Mrs. Herbert's instructions, turning into a side driveway that led to a separate garage. I parked on the small patch of asphalt beside the garage, hiding my car so Mary wouldn't see it and ruin the surprise. I've never heard of your girlfriend's parents inviting you to their house for a surprise first meeting for Christmas dinner, but I loved Mary too much to decline. And, to be fair, the look on her face was going to be priceless. I took the bottle of halfway decent white wine out of the back seat, still in its paper bag from the liquor store. When I told my mom the reason I couldn't make it home for Christmas Eve, she'd recommended bringing a gift. Walking toward my girlfriend's childhood home, my palms started to get sweaty. I was glad I had followed her advice. I walked in front of a big bay window on my way to the front door, and I glanced through it for a moment while passing by. Mr. Herbert was sitting at the dining room table, his hands folded in front of him. Even though I definitely walked right across his field of view, he was staring down the driveway like he hadn't noticed at all, and was still waiting for me to show up. The lifeless, weary look on his face was even worse than when I'd first seen Reggie. Whatever Mr. Herbert was thinking about... It looked like he was on the verge of tears, his mouth hanging partially open. How had Mary managed to get out of this town without dying on the inside, too? I stopped at the front door and took a deep breath, holding the bottle of wine to my chest like a shield. Putting another fake smile on my face, I rang the doorbell. I nearly dropped the wine when the door instantly opened. Come on in, Mrs. Herbert said holding the door wide and gesturing inward. She was wearing a black dress with white polka dots, a pearl necklace, white gloves, and bright red lipstick that matched her heels. My first impression? She was a perfect mom who'd stepped straight out of an ancient TV rerun, if you didn't count the crooked little twist of her nose. Uh, thanks, Mrs. Herbert. I stepped inside quickly. I'm sorry I'm late. "'Nonsense. You were just in time.' She closed and locked the door, then held her hand out to me, palm down. "'And please, call me Anne.' "'Okay, Anne.' I took her hand and gave it an awkward squeeze, not sure if I was supposed to kiss the back of it or not. "'Thanks,' I lamely repeated instead. "'Of course. This way, please.' She made it sound more like a question than a command leading me out of the little entryway. We entered the living room, with a dark hardwood floor, a gold and red rug covering most of it, 
the chairs and couch all in matching deep red velvet. An elderly woman with curly white hair was asleep in one of the chairs, snoring quietly. A purple blanket pulled up to her neck. Anne winked at me and put a finger to her lips to shush me, despite the fact that the loudest thing in the room was her heels tapping on the floor as we moved on. The dining room was dominated by a wood table and chair set, resting on a gold and purple rug atop more hardwood. And who is this strapping young lad? Mr. Herbert asked, rising to his feet. He was wearing a gray suit with a red tie and glossy black shoes, making me feel even more underdressed than Anne did. His previous expression was totally gone, replaced by a warm, welcoming grin. This is Thomas Cole, our little princess's sweetheart, Anne said. Thomas, this is William. Pleased to meet you, son, William said, extending his hand. I was hit by a one-two punch. First, the juvenile urge to correct my name, then the shock of my girlfriend's dad calling me son. It took me a second to realize he must not have meant it that way, and I quickly reached out to shake his hand nearly bumping our fingertips together in the process. Same to you, sir. He chuckled and shook his head. Please, Thomas, call me William. If my girlfriend's parents were nice enough to pretend I wasn't 30 minutes late, then I could survive being called Thomas for the night. All right. William it is. Great. That's settled then. William pointed at my left hand, which was still clutching the wine bottle tight to my chest. And what's this? Oh, right, I said. Uh, It's to thank you for inviting me. I held it out to him. There was a deep snort from the living room, the old woman's breath hitching in her sleep comically loudly. I carefully kept my face neutral and pretended not to hear it. Anne stepped in, taking the wine from me instead. That is so sweet. She headed off toward the kitchen. I'll tend to dinner. Thank you, honey, William said, pulling out a chair for me. Please, Thomas, have a seat. We should still have a few minutes to talk before the little lady arrives. Yeah, all right. I sat down, expecting the worst. My ex in high school had a single mom so I'd never had the talk with a girlfriend's father. Before he could start, I said, The hedges are really awesome, by the way. A little brown nosing never hurt anyone. William sat down and put his hand to his chest. Thank you very much. They're a lot of work, but it's worth it. I was about to agree, until shattering glass in the kitchen interrupted me. Whoa, is she okay? I stood up so fast that my chair fell down behind me and clattered to the floor. William winced at the sound, his eyes staying closed a full three seconds. It was long enough for Anne herself to come to the doorway between the kitchen and dining room, smiling. I'm just fine, dear, she said. I'm afraid it was your gift. It fell right into the sink. Oh, well, that's okay, I lied. I was going to be eating a lot of ramen and Taco Bell value items thanks to that wine. Anne said, At least we didn't wake up Nana before dinner time, right? She pointed at the fallen chair. Yeah. Sorry. I picked it up and sat back down. By the time I did, Anne had already gone back to the kitchen. You guys probably had a wine picked out for dinner anyway, right? I asked William. Not a drop of the stuff in our whole house, actually, he said. He sounded proud. Really? No wine at all? I tried to sound surprised. Instead of depressed that my money had literally and figuratively gone down the drain. I haven't touched alcohol since... He paused in thought. The moment lingered, his eyes going out of focus, his mouth slightly open. He exhaled in a long, quiet wheeze. I shifted in my seat. (sighs) Suddenly, William licked his lips, smiled, and looked at me again. Well, since we've moved in here together, I'd say. I was quite the drinker when I was your age, but 
Now that I've dropped the habit, I have more time for the important things, like beautifying the garden. And taking care of your lovely lady and princess, Anne said as she walked into the room. She set a round silver tray on the dining room table. Nothing is more important. William took Anne's hand and kissed the back of it. I glanced down at the tray. It was covered in alternating types of crackers and cheese. Not a single inch of metal visible past food laid out in a perfectly symmetrical swirl. It looked and smelled amazing. I didn't dare touch it. It was more like a piece of art than an appetizer, and I wasn't going to be the first person to ruin it. William ignored the tray. So, Thomas, what are you studying at Penn? It was only natural for Mary's parents to assume their amazing daughter would date someone who went to the same prestigious college as she did. And it was easy to mix up Penn with Penn State. Still, I had hoped it wouldn't come up. I'm a business major at Pennsylvania State Abington, actually. There was another gross-sounding snuffle from the living room, followed by a quiet moan. William didn't react to it, saying, I'm sure they have an excellent business program there. I blinked. He sounded way more mellow about it than I could have hoped. Yeah, it's pretty good. Great. I hope the drive wasn't too bad from there. Nah, it's only about an hour. Not counting half an hour going in circles. That's good to hear, Thomas. You were just in time. I leaned forward. Actually, I was wondering, where did the idea for all this come from? All this? William asked. Well, the, the whole surprise thing. I've never even met you guys before. It's pretty crazy. As soon as I heard what I'd said, I quickly added, I'm happy to meet you. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. William laughed and waved me off. Likewise, son. And honestly, I'm not quite sure how my wife hatched this little scheme. Honey. Anne stepped into view the second he called for her. She tilted her head and smiled. We wanted to know so much more about you, Thomas. Christmas is the perfect time to get together, wouldn't you say? For sure, I said. I gotta know, how'd you get my number? Anne didn't exactly answer, making an inquisitive, mm -hmm. My cell number? Did you call the registrar or something? That had been my going theory, but now that I said it out loud, I saw the problem. I looked at William, then back to Anne. Wait, if you didn't know where I go to school, how did you know where to call? I didn't, dear, Anne replied, still smiling. That's all she said, as if it was all I needed to hear. My brow furrowed. Even with crappy reception, I could tell the difference between these two on the phone. It definitely hadn't been William. Didn't what? William gasped and stood up, pointing out the window. Thomas, hide under the table. She's home. Sure enough, Mary's red Elantra was coming down the driveway. I sighed, genuinely relieved I wouldn't be alone with these two much longer. I turned to Anne, hoping there was still time for an answer. She winked and made playful shooing motions toward the table. I knelt down and crawled under the table, wondering if she winked to admit she was joking about the call or just because I was playing along with the surprise. Anne and William walked into the living room, and from my angle, I couldn't see anything in there except Nana's blanket-covered lower legs. I waited, and I waited, minutes passing, long enough that I wondered if Mary had found my car. The front door opened, and William shouted, Welcome home, princess! So much for letting Nana sleep in. Hi, Daddy. Mary was much quieter than him. Hi, Mom. We are so happy you could make it, Anne said. I had to, Mary said, more solemn than I'd ever heard her before. I promised I wouldn't let you spend holidays alone like this. William chuckled. Speaking of which, we have a surprise for you. They walked into the living room, so I backed up a few inches 
in case my fingers were showing. A, a surprise? Mary sounded more wary than excited. As soon as they reached the dining room, I burst out from under the table, raised my arms in the air, and half whispered, half yelled, Surprise! Seeing the family unit standing side by side, William's arm around Mary's shoulders, something struck me. My mom had given me the wine advice, but my dad had said to pay attention because your girlfriend's mom would be a spoiler for who you might be married to in twenty years. Maybe recessive genes had played a trick on this family, because Anne and William both had light brown hair and eyes close to mine. Mary was blonde, with big blue eyes. Her jaw dropped when she saw me. The shock was as priceless as I'd hoped for about one second. Then her face screwed up, and she stared at her mom. But how? I laughed a little, stepping closer. That's what I'd like to know. William moved to keep one hand on Mary's shoulder and put the other on mine. Now we can have a wonderful dinner together, like a loving family. The scents hit me all at once, turkey and mashed potatoes, followed by apple pie. My mouth watered. How had I not noticed how good it smelled before? Mary stepped right up to me, close enough that I put my arms around her for a hug. She shook her head and planted her hands on my chest, keeping us a foot apart. You have to leave town now, Tommy, she hissed. This close, I saw that her eyes were misting up. What? I looked between her and her parents. Anne and William were still smiling widely, even though Mary had been loud enough that they must have heard. Just go, Tommy, please. Mary's hands shook against my chest. I I'm sorry we didn't talk about this first. I know meeting the parents is a big step. I reached for her hands. She pulled them away. That's not it. You don't get it. Anne leaned in, close to our faces, her smile unfazed by Mary's words. It's dinner time, you lovebirds. She pointed at the table. Thomas, you sit here, and Isabel, your seat is right where it always is. Of all the weirdness of the day, that rocked me more than anything. Wait, what? Isabel? Mary clamped her eyes shut, sending a tear down each cheek. Just go! <coughs> there was a dry cough from the living room. All three of the Herberts went totally still, Mary's eyes opening at the same time that her parents winced theirs shut. I'm sorry, Mary whispered. I'm sorry, Tommy. I'm so sorry. Why? What for? I put my hand out to her, and she turned away, hugging herself. Anne laughed. My mistake. Dinner will be a while yet. Dinner smelled like it was ready. Until it didn't. Between one breath and the next, the odors were gone. William chuckled in his casual, good-natured way. That's okay, honey. It's story time anyway. He put his hand on my back and used the touch to guide me into the living room. When I tried to stop so I could ask Mary what the hell was going on, he kept on pushing. He was way stronger than he looked. Hey, hang on. Someone tell me... Be quiet, everyone. No more bickering. I could barely make out the raspy words. As I turned the corner, I saw the source. Nana was awake, holding a thick red, purple, and gold book on her blanketed lap. It's story time, she said. Cataracts covered her pupils, making them look permanently huge and white. Despite that, she looked right into my eyes. William led me toward the sofa and chairs. I stumbled along with him, looking back over my shoulder. Mary stood at the edge of the room, a hand over her mouth, shaking with sobs. I twisted away and turned to go to her. Two vice grips clamped onto my upper arms, pulled me back, and shoved me down into a red velvet chair. William put his hand down on my shoulder, and when I wrenched against it to try to stand up, all I did was hurt myself. 
I opened my mouth to shout at him, to tell him to let me go, that he was being a shitty host and a worse father. Not a sound came out, and William just smiled at me and put his finger to his lips. I put a hand on my throat and turned to look at Mary. I couldn't see her, the back of the chair tall enough to block my view. Anne sat down on the couch near Nana's side and crossed her legs, hands on her lap. Once upon a time, Nana began, there was a royal family with a tiny kingdom of their own. Her voice was so rough, it sounded like she was on the verge of a cough with every breath. Bad enough that it made me want to clear my own throat. I couldn't. She slowly opened the first page of the book. It was a pop-up book, incredibly well-made, with dozens of individual segments in lifelike detail. A scene unfolded before me, and instead of a fairy tale castle, it was inside a suburban living room at night. A man stood in the center of the room, a bottle of liquor in one hand, the other raised up over his head in a fist. On the ground was a woman, arms up to protect herself, blood leaking from her nose. There was a broken lamp beside her on the carpet, and garish colors from the television shot out across the floor. A little girl's head alternated hiding behind a couch and peeking out, back and forth, a hand over her mouth in shock. Sir William Herbert, Lady Anne Herbert, and Lady Isabel Herbert happily ruled together, and yet they knew something was missing. Nana stared at me as she spoke, reciting the words from memory. She turned to the next page. I opened my mouth again. It was story time, so nothing came out. They needed a wise matriarch to help guide the family's future, and they welcomed her into their home. The next scene was the same living room. Before it had been dark, with long shadows and muted colors, the second page was bright, the sun shining through the windows, the lamp gone. William now shared the center with Anne, both smiling, wearing a blue suit and green dress in the exact same style as what they were wearing today. Little Isabel was holding Anne's hand, looking up at her parents without a smile of her own. A red velvet chair was in the back of the room, and in it sat Nana, blanket and all. The matron saw that Lady Isabel was very special, surely the prettiest little princess in all the land. Nana's breath was coming easier, voice a bit louder. She pulled a tab on the book, and the paper girl's head grew blonde hair. As wise as she was, the matron's influence was weak except within the borders of Isabel's kingdom. So things were set in motion. The page turned to another dark scene, inside of a high school auditorium. Bundles of purple and red balloons were taped to the walls, and small gemstones placed on the floor twinkled like there was a disco ball spinning overhead. On a raised stage stood Isabel, wearing a white dress and standing next to her prom date, with a crowd of dressed-up teens looking up at them. A banner on the front of the stage read, Congratulations, Class of 2015. Isabel was holding a plastic tiara over her head, and when she lowered it into place, the changes were instantaneous. Everyone in the audience raised their hands over their heads in a silent cheer, their mouths all turning upward into joyous smiles. On her 18th birthday, Isabel was crowned Queen Isabel Mary Beth Herbert. Every soul in the kingdom of Shimong learned the truth. Their proper place was to serve, to help Queen Isabel achieve her destiny, as Sir William and Lady Anne had learned before them. Anne nodded slowly. Tears ran down over the curve of her big, blissful smile. I strained to stand up, blood rushing in my ears. I grabbed William's wrist in both hands and pushed, and it hardly budged. I squeezed hard enough that my fingernails dug into his flesh, and he merely smiled, pointing at the storybook and nodding encouragingly. 
as if we were still getting to the good part. Now that Shimong was perfect, the matron had even more to do. Nana's voice was strong now, not a hint of her age present. It may even have been the kind of voice you would confuse for Anne's if you were talking on a cell phone. The page turned, and the setup was similar to the last. Isabel was on a raised stage again, in a grassy field, wearing a purple robe and cap. She was in front of a podium, giving a speech to a group of other students, standing over a new banner. Congrats, class of 2019. Her undergraduate graduation. Queen Isabel needed the finest education if she was to rule over all she surveyed. Nana sat taller in the chair, and yet her face was still deeply lined, eyes cataract, fingers shaking as she manipulated the book. She traveled to a renowned school, yet close enough that the matron's influence ensured she was the top of her class. Mary leapt into view, running at Nana with a kitchen knife in her hand. Relax and listen, dear, Nana kindly commanded, without looking away from me. You're just in time for the ending. Mary slowed to a stop, the knife inches from Nana's chest. Mary took one small step backward, then another, visibly shaking as she resisted. Nana continued, unconcerned. As perfect as Isabel would someday be, she was still a youngster, weak to the temptations of love. And yet the matron was both wise and kind. She knew that Queen Isabel would need a handsome king, so why not choose her secret lover? She pulled a tab, and the scene subtly changed. The sign showed the future, the graduating legal class of 2022, and now I was sitting in the front row, frozen mid-clap. No, Mary whispered, a hoarse wheeze from the depths of her throat. For him to be part of the Herbert family, he would need to be a proper young man. Nana's voice boomed, filling the living room, echoing off the walls. He would be free of vice, especially those the matron had already scoured out of Sir William. For their perfect fairy tale romance, surely the betrothed must have met at the same prestigious school and they would never bicker, never fret over the small details that plagued mundane relationships, and their children would be the most beautiful in the world. The little paper me suddenly had blonde hair, blue eyes, and a chiseled chin. My eyes itched, and my scalp burned, and I wanted to shout and reach for my face. Instead, I sat quietly and listened. The page turned, and Isabel was standing on another, taller stage, in a room with confetti and balloons dangling in midair, connected to nothing. This time the banner read, Congratulations, Governor Herbert! And everyone in the room was smiling just as wide as I was, standing at her side. Then another tab was pulled, and Governor changed to president, the crowd of grinning people at ground level getting twice as thick. The future was bright for Queen Isabel Herbert. How would her tale end? Happily ever after. The matron closed the book. The knife clattered to the floor, and my dear Isabel ran out of the room with a shrill wail. I wanted to go to her, to hold her, to ask her if it was all true. It wasn't proper right now, so I wouldn't. I couldn't. She's a little emotional around the holidays, Lady Anne said. I'll sit with her until she feels better. She stood and smoothed her dress, leisurely walking away. The matron leaned back into her chair with a sigh, her eyes fluttering closed. 
Welcome to the family, King Thomas, she said, a hint of rasp creeping back into her voice. We'll have dinner once Queen Isabel has calmed down. Sir William took his hand off of my shoulder, both of which were stained by a thin trickle of blood from where my nails had cut his wrist. I stood up and joined him, taking my proper seat at the dining room table, which would be at Queen Isabel's side when she sat at the head. I didn't want to sit there. I wanted to run out the front door, get into my car, and drive straight home. Except that didn't make sense, because I was home, and it wouldn't be proper for me to get up. Moving from here wouldn't help Queen Isabel, so I wouldn't budge, even though I felt like throwing up. Not that I would do that, either. We would have dinner, then I would travel to Abington, break my lease, drop out of school, and get into Penn Law. I didn't know how. I just would. I saw my reflection in the window. Blonde hair, perfectly brushed. Blue eyes staring blankly ahead. Mouth hanging open. A royal blue suit. Silently waiting for my next moment to serve. Unwilling and unable to scream. Because I shouldn't. It wasn't proper. Half an hour later, when the ladies returned, I stood and smiled. Queen Isabel, you're looking positively radiant tonight. She wept and took her rightful place at the table. Author's Note This story began with the idea of a pretty unsavory fellow visiting his girlfriend's family for the holidays. They were the perfect 50s television family, and by the end of the dinner, the protagonist would have been slowly transformed into one of them, down to his core, forgetting who he used to be entirely. I got stuck on a major decision point. Was the girlfriend in on it? I didn't want her to be, but if she wasn't, then how did the protagonist even end up there? Meanwhile, I knew I had to have a creepy granny at dinner, both for the sake of the story and to tantalize Rish Outfield's depraved interest in ominous old people. <laughs> One thing led to another, and the idea of her reading an unsettling storybook at dinner rapidly evolved. Something clicked, and granny was gone, replaced by the matron. Once she existed, her influence quickly spread throughout the story, and soon, everything ended happily ever after. Many thanks to Big and Rish for this opportunity, and for all their work putting the contest together. Being one of the lucky winners is honestly a highlight of 2020 for me. P.S. Here is a fun factoid for longtime Dune Stephians. This story also would have fit the 2010 Broken Mirror prompt. A child is proclaimed king. Or queen. But it turns out to be more than just a game. All right, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the story. Uh, you know, it's pretty interesting that Rob would say that getting his story on here is a highlight of 2020. Considering 2020... Eh, does that really mean anything? <laughs> That's like saying, hey, I managed to poop today. That's a highlight of 2020. <laughs> yeah, so this was a little bit of an interesting story. I do like what he said in his author's note there where he said that this could also fit in with, what was it, 2010? Was that how That's long ago it was that we did that? That's what he says. Oh, frick, man. We's old. Babu frick. Yes. What, did you pick up Babu on that? Frick. <laughs> oh. oh no. Did you pick up on that when you read the story that it could also have been a child is proclaimed king or queen? Well, unfortunately, he included that in one of his emails when he sent it to us, so I had that already in my head. So, yes. <laughs> Okay. But not, not really because, you know, someone said, hey, you know what? This could also be that. And so unfair advantage, I guess. 
Big, what was the town where this took place in called? Oh, it was a weird name. Shamong? Shamong! Right? Is that it? Yes, that is right. I just wanted you to say that. (laughs) You have a particular uh, fondness for Shamong? Shamong! Yeah? (laughs) I mean, before we started recording, you were telling me that there is a statue of Mighty Joe Young in Shamong? Yeah, that's right. I looked it up on on Google Maps. The Shemong Township in New Jersey is in Burlington County, and it includes a statue of Mighty Joe the Gorilla. Let's uh, go there before the end comes. (laughs) All right. We'll have to have a huge Doonstief road trip where we go all around, and one of the places we will hit will be... Shamong. Um, so, uh, before we talk about the story, I wanted to ask you what it was like when you met your in-laws for the first time. It seems like that would be a super stressful experience. The, the, the meeting of the in-laws, the going and sort of presenting yourself, trying to sell yourself to these strangers. You know, it was... I don't know that it was super stressful. They were They were pretty welcoming and I uh, you know I've I've always been relatively comfortable socially I don't know it's interesting cuz you know they lived a they live way out in the country I believe that we must have said this before on the show but town that my wife grew up in was not a town even they don't call it a town cuz you have to have reach a certain level of population and I believe 1000 people get you to a town (laughs) this place was just a village and uh yeah so it was way out there and I, i went to visit her in january in canada and so yeah we were driving down the freeway in the middle of nowhere in the coldest time of the year which oh man that was a joy but you know (laughs) They had made a big Sunday dinner. It was really similar to this kind of a thing. I do remember that I'd never had rutabagas before, but they had rutabagas for us to have um, at the dinner that day. And and I had them and I was surprised at how much I liked them. I thought rutabagas, those have got to be gross or else I would have eaten them by now, I guess. You know, if people liked rutabagas, why had I never eaten them before? But... They were actually pretty darn good. Of course, generally with rutabagas and most vegetables that are similar to rutabagas, you just put tons of butter and salt on them. And (laughs) when it comes down to it, you cover anything in butter and salt, it's going to be good. (laughs) So there's that. But yeah, it wasn't too bad. Um, It was a little weird, I have to admit. It's always strange to talk to adults when you're a young person that you don't know, you know what I mean? That aren't already kind of safe or whatever the the proper term for it is. Yeah, it was, it was a little weird, a little uh, unusual, interesting, but it wasn't bad. And I, it's funny because my wife later told me how much they hated you. (laughs) And when this happened, we hadn't really been going out for very long. When I first met her parents, we'd been friends for a long time, but we hadn't actually started dating until much later. You know, I knew her for a couple of years and we were good friends for a really long time before we ever actually became romantic with each other. But at one point I went to the bathroom and while I was out, her mom like whips out these things. Okay, come over here. I wanted to show you these. I was thinking about using these as the centerpieces on the tables at your guys' reception. So this is her mom. And, oh, shoot, I don't know how long we've been going out, but it wasn't very long. But apparently she already knew what was coming before, you know, I had even decided on anything like that. And when we started dating, too, you know, we'd been friends when my wife still lived nearby. But she'd moved back to Canada at this point. And so we'd started dating and I only would see her 
every now and then when I could manage to get up to Canada, which was a thousand mile drive, an 18 hour drive to get from where I was to Edmonton, Alberta. Just seemed uh, like a, just a funny thing that she was all ready to uh, assume that we were going to be getting married. They're finally getting married. They're finally getting married. Ick. There's a wedding in Agrabah. I can't believe you know that. <laughs> I think I only know it from the trailer. Did they or the? I suppose it wasn't really a trailer. The the uh, commercial. commercial for it that they would put on at the start of VHS tapes that you had to play your way through to watch whatever that you actually bought to see. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It wasn't. It wasn't nearly as stressful uh, for me, truthfully, as you know people tend to make it out to be. But yeah, I mean, my my wife's parents are good folks, so you know, I guess it all depends on what the family is like. If you're coming to meet the parents and there's, you know, the matron who is controlling the entire township of Shamong using her mental powers or her witchcraft or whatever. What do you think it was? Witchcraft? Witchcraft! Yeah, I I, I think it was witchcraft. Wasn't just... uh, Professor X powers. I guess it couldn't just be Professor X powers because uh, she also made his hair turned blonde and his eyes turn blue and stuff, right? So yeah, did I, you did you enjoy doing the uh, the old lady? <laughs> rephrase, please. <laughs> <laughs> did you enjoy voicing the old lady? Well, sure. Yeah, I I always enjoy doing. See, I almost said old women. Words that will come back to haunt me, right? Rephrase, please. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things to voice, or the, you know, woman called witch things. Not witch. 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 Uh, I actually ended up having to do it twice because I didn't realize until the end that ev- that when she spoke she was getting younger that she started out super frail and old and then re- regressed or you know Benjamin buttoned whatever you call that and <laughs> so i had to do the lines over again i don't know I, I i i'm always afraid of the old women kind of thing and i don't know that i've talked to you about this but I, i've certainly talked to myself about this it, when i go to the, the family <laughs> cabin sometimes i'll go back on on the back deck and i'll i will read and the sun shines down on the deck and it's really nice and one time i heard a sound i I was pretty sure i was out there by myself and i heard a sound and it was the next cabin up on the hill they had a porch swing and this porch swing was swinging i thought by itself i was just like oh the wind is is moving that back and forth but i discovered that there was an old woman sitting on the porch swing swinging back and forth and it really creeped me out. <laughs> I would go out there and I would read, and she would be out there. Watching. Watching, yeah. I always, I always felt like she's watching me in disapproval. And my eyesight is bad enough, or the light is bad enough, or the, there are enough trees, fill in the, one of these excuses, that I couldn't always tell whether she was there or not unless the swing was moving. And even then, maybe it is the wind this time. I don't know, there was something disconcerting about that of maybe she's watching right now. And a story just writes itself of, Rish, I don't know how to tell you this, there's there's no old woman that lives at that cabin. In fact, it's for sale uh, ever since the owner <laughs> died in 2011. Right. And the call is coming from inside the house, Rish. I, uh... Yeah, that, that writes itself, too. It's just... Uh, have, have you, you checked, checked the, the children? children? I don't know. Everybody has their, their thing. And I'm sure there are people that have mocked you for your fear of cockroaches. But I understand. <laughs> uh, and I, it's rare that somebody will mock me for my fear of old women. But... It has been done. You know, there's some people, I just don't get that. There's nothing less threatening than an old lady. 
<laughs> but Rob Broughton begs to differ in this story. <laughs> Do you really think there's somebody that might mock me for being afraid of cockroaches? Is there such a thing as a person who likes cockroaches? Yeah, there are. There are people that buy them at pet stores as pets, not to feed to something else, but to have as pets. Not, and... to, not to feed to something else, but to feed to themselves. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I remember uh, hearing a story back when I was uh, living in South America that they had had a contest where they had people eating cockroaches. And the contest was who could eat the most cockroaches. And supposedly, these cockroaches were raised in a clean environment so they weren't, you know, filthy and filled with bacteria and disease and so forth. But... From what I heard, the contest ended when people were all vomiting all over the place <laughs> because the cockroaches had made them sick. So I don't know if they really were raised in a clean environment, but I, I don't think I could do that. You know that, like how they would do that on Fear Factor yeah, and, and stuff like that, where they would make you eat some nasty insect or something like that? Or like worms or... Yeah, I think that was the whole point of that show was what can we make people eat? Yeah, uh, I couldn't do that. I mean, there's certain things that I've tried. I, I I probably have said on here before that I ate a cockroach brownie one time. Just Wait, what? Oh, sorry, not a cockroach brownie. That would let me let me start over. I ate a cricket brownie one time. It's one of those things. Every now and then, when you work in news, things will just show up in the newsroom. I think our goofy morning reporter had gone somewhere for the morning show where they offer cricket brownies. And I think he'd eaten some of them on air. And then he also brought some of them back to the station. And you could try them out if you wanted to. They were just sitting there in the break room. Enjoy a cricket brownie. And I was just like... "Uh." I could do a bite, right? And then I could say that I've eaten a cricket before. And so I did it. And, you know, it wasn't, I mean, it was in a brownie, so it wasn't that bad. Uh, I, I want to say that the, basically the crickets were the flour that was used in the brownie, <laughs> which is kind of gross when you think about it. But And it was a little crunchy, I have to admit. A little, uh, almost like it was made of sand or something like that. <laughs> But I managed to eat it, but I could not do the same with cockroaches, and that would just be too much. I could probably eat most insects, but a cockroach I could not do it with. I don't know if I could do worms either, though. Worms are kind of, they're a little icky. Do you think you could eat a worm? Yeah, sure. Yeah? Pre presented with the option of anthrax ripple or cockroach cluster. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to go with anthrax. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. It's funny. I think you have told me that story, the the cricket one, but I blocked it out. It's one of those where I, I had to go to therapy to unremember it. And uh, as soon as we're done recording, I will make another appointment. You'll be heading back to therapy again, saying, damn it, I wish you'd stop telling that story. This is getting costly <laughs> i don't know if i could eat a worm either you know um i don't know if you guys did this when you were in high school but when i was in high school in our biology class we had to dissect a worm mm. no we didn't and these worms they were preserved you know so that they could be kept around for a long time so they were in i don't know formaldehyde or something like that and there was a guy I want to say his name was Chad. I can't remember his last name. Started with a C as well. But anyways, there was a guy who is sitting there as as people are starting to dissect the worm. And he goes, hey, how much would you guys give me if I ate this? <laughs> this, is, this is a story that I heard. My friend was in this class. I was not in this class. I was in a separate class. I don't think anybody even took him up on it. I don't think anybody even said, yeah, I'll give you 10 bucks or something. I think they're all like, 
nothing. You're not going to eat that. And he's like, yeah, I would. What do you give me? I'm not going to give you nothing because you're not going to eat it. So who cares? And so he friggin' ate the thing. He put the worm that was in like formaldehyde preservatives or whatever the heck. And he put it in his mouth and he chewed it up. My friend was telling me you could see the worm just like out, uh, hanging halfway out of his mouth as he's like slurping it up. Mm. Oh my God. And what? I mean, like formaldehyde's like really bad for you, isn't it? <laughs> But just the idea of eating worms makes me think of that. <laughs> so I don't think I could do that either. Did this all come from you eating rutabaga for the first time at your future in-law's <laughs> house? Where? No, I don't think so. I think we, we <laughs> I think we were on something else. I don't know how I got onto the <laughs> subject. Of eating gross things. Yeah, I guess it was just me being afraid of old ladies and you being afraid of cockroaches, I I suppose. Oh, yes, and me being afraid of cockroaches. We haven't done this show in so long. Uh, in case people are just joining us, every episode gets off on tangents like this. Yep, it's pretty standard. They have nothing to do with the story we just shared. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> When your story leads you to something great, like the eating of uh, cockroaches and worms, you just run with it, man. That's what you do. <laughs> well, shoot. Well, yeah, let's talk about something about the story. Okay, so in his author's note, he talked a little bit about the happy ending. Because on the surface, it does have a happy ending, an extremely, and they all lived happily ever after ending. But I think it's the fact that it is an involuntary happy ending that makes it disturbing. We, we prize our free will almost above anything. Our freedom to go where we want to go, say what we want to say, or be who we want to be. And the idea of a being that's powerful enough to take that away from you, that's something that has always been feared in literature, in religion, in mythology. You know, how many Star Trek episodes had Kirk and Spock go to a planet where somebody with their minds could make them do whatever he wanted? And essentially that's what's happening here. She transforms these characters into what she wants for the, the story like the whole town that, that I love that idea of people just being mopey or surly or just regular folks. And then when the matron's influence hits them, suddenly they're bright and enthusiastic and excited because she's making them be that way. She's, she's puppeteering them. There, there's something super scary about that. If, if this were a, well, apparently, over on CBS All Access, there is a new Twilight Zone series. Oh, yeah? That Jordan Peele is the host of. Oh, okay. I think I have seen something about that. This would make a perfect episode of a Twilight Zone, of a new, the new Twilight Zone. That, that's, that's among the highest compliment I can give you, Rob, is it's the proper length for a Twilight Zone. It's got this, the right like three act structure of a twilight zone and then it has that punch you in the stomach ending that a twilight zone has and yeah it just uh, if i had any influence in the film business at all i would i would at least send them this story to consider but uh, but you know what i mean that the, the that it's scary that he notices this stuff is weird but the scariest thing is when it happens to him yeah, when all of a sudden his free will is gone and he's just like, but this isn't what I want. This will not make me happy. This will only make you ha Why do you think that the matron <laughs> wants that in the first place? Why does she put her will into making the perfect family out of this other family and instead of herself? That's uh, an interesting thing. You know, maybe somebody who just... Just somebody who forces somebody else to be happy. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, I am going to force you to have 
the perfect life, the life that everyone dreams of or whatever thing. It's also kind of interesting because like sometimes things can be handed to you. You know what I mean? There uh, there are things out there. I guess maybe the lottery could be one of those kind of things. Or uh, like, you know, as a writer, like we could use Joe Hill as an example. You know, Joe Hill is the son of Stephen King. So his name is not really Joe Hill. It's Joe King. But he changed his name when he wanted to become a writer just so that he could actually earn his place in writer dumb writer hood writer sphere circles <laughs> because he wanted to make sure that he really was a good writer and that he deserved what he got and there's plenty of people who will talk like oh what if you found a genie in a bottle what would your three wishes be be like well i would wish that i was the greatest writer ever and that i could sell all my books in the end, though, you think that would make you happy? Or would you just be like, uh, well, I didn't do this. This is the genie writing the books. I'm not actually, you know, myself a good book writer. And in the end, you'll be like, I'm worthless still, even though I can do this. I don't know. I suppose it depends, you know, on what matters most to you and what I guess what comes with it, <laughs> maybe, I don't know, maybe you're just like, yeah, well, who cares? I'm in the lap of luxury and I can I can have anything that I want or something like that. I don't care if I actually earned it or not, or if I'm actually worthwhile. I, I'm just going to live a life of hedonism that's going to be just fine for me. Or, you know, will you just be like, ah, oh, geez, man, I, I've earned nothing that I have in my life. My life is worthless you know, you wind up jumping off a bridge or something someday because you feel worthless because you you didn't actually earn the things that you uh, have. That seems like basically what's going on here. You know what I mean? And it's a it's a common thing in fiction. You know that that whole trope of you know having to earn your keep, earn what you want. You know you can't just get it be careful what you wish for for you may just get it that kind of thing well see yeah i was thinking that sounded like a twilight zone too you know the three wishes is everything great but it turns out not to be great it it starts to eat you up inside I, that, that sounds like a broken mirror prompt as well <laughs> yeah uh you know a genie gives someone three wishes only to find out that it's not what it's cracked up to be. That just seems like a, a, a really fun... Like, I would love to write a story about that, too. I, the writer who's, you know, I wish to be the next J.K. Rowling or what, or you know what I mean, the, the super, super, super popular writer. But yeah, that idea that I didn't get here on my own, I didn't earn this, the genie did all this stuff. I'm a fraud. I'm no better than James Patterson. How could you? I live with myself. Sorry, that was mean. I just, I, 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 I would like to explore that. I, that seems like a really interesting story. Yeah, that's just one of those things. You, you want to feel like you matter, I think. I think that everybody wants to do something worthwhile with their life. You know, they want to make a difference or do something special Especially these days, a, a lot of people just don't, they, they they have a hard time finding meaning in their life, you know, and just working as a drone in an office or whatever. <laughs> it's not cutting it for them in a lot of ways. It leaves people uh, searching for something else and finding a genie in the bottle and, you know, getting that stuff without trying is not necessarily going to make that happen. You know, you've got to actually do something of worth to feel that way. And it is, it is an interesting concept for sure. Well, I want to thank Rob for sending us this story and giving us something to talk about. Like an hour ago, you asked me about what, what does the, what does the witch, sorry, what does the matron get? 
out of all of this. And, uh, you know, she played with dolls when she was little and liked controlling them and running their lives. And she never outgrew that. Yeah, there you she go. She had the ability to turn people into dolls. And uh, that control, that uh, I want everything to be perfect kind of thing. I, I, I love that the main character <laughs> went to a lesser school, right? <laughs> And he feels embarrassed about that, that they automatically... What was the name of the school that they think that he went to? Penn, instead of Penn State. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the girl goes to Penn, which is an Ivy League school. He goes to Penn State, not even Penn State, Penn State, which I think is, you know, the one that we all think of when because of their football team. But I think Penn State is like a system where they have various campuses, kind of like California has the... University of California at Los Angeles, University of California at Davis, etc. And they also have the CSU at all the different places. I think that what where does he say he goes? The University of Pennsylvania. He goes to Pennsylvania State Abington. Pennsylvania State Abington. But I, I yeah, they they assume he goes to this Ivy League school and he disabuses them of that and then <laughs> You know, basically with a snap of the fingers, now he's going to have to get into that school because that's the I, that's the perfect life. <laughs> they both went to this school and it's just the the path that the matron wanted them to go on to fit her idea of perfection. I don't know, that it's it's super dark in a Twilight Zone sort of way that, you know. Now he's blonde because <laughs> blonde is better. You know what I mean? Right. It's a Stepford Wives kind of thing uh -huh. where it's just like, no, I love my wife. And he's like, yes, but she has small breasts. <laughs> no, I love, I love my wife. Yeah. But wouldn't you rather they be large? <laughs> and he's like, look, I love my wife. Okay, but well, maybe if they and and you know it's a slippery slope, and it's just like oh shoot, and before you know it, she has she has become a Russ Meyer creation, and I I don't know I feel like this is like that only it's the matron's idea of perfection. Right. Good stuff, dude. Yeah, it's interesting. It's a lot of fun. But yeah, thanks a lot, Rob, for uh, sending the story out to us and for participating in our little contest or event or extravaganza bonanza third stanza george costanza george costanza king of the idiots <laughs> ah uh it's been a lot of fun um i think it's time to call this one it's getting a little late so we'll uh we'll go ahead and bring it into today's episode but don't don't you worry don't you fret your little head over that because we'll be back soon it's not going to be six more months before you get the next episode. Yeah, we got another one coming up real soon and many more along with it. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. We will catch you again next time. We'll catch you again very soon. I have been not rich outfield, but rich outfield. <laughs> and I have been not big Anklevich, but Chet Anklevich. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Thanks for listening to The Dune Steve. Good night. Take two. So today's story is... Service with a Smile by Rob Broughton. About the author. Rob Broughton loves to kill. Oh. Tell us how you really feel. Well, that's nice. <laughs> a genie gives someone three wishes, but they turn out to... What's the opposite of a blessing in disguise? <laughs> But it turns out the wishes aren't what they were expecting. Yeah, but... <laughs>
<laughs> you, you know what I mean. I, I want him to say that it's yeah, no, the it's... opposite of a blessing in disguise. Okay, um, why don't do you... you go ahead and read that, and then we'll do the post story stuff. Sorry, did you say I'll just go ahead and read it, or you want me to? I said, why don't you go ahead and read it? I don't have it up, so I don't know what it says. You having trouble getting it up? Yeah, that's unfortunately the way it goes. The older you get. Okay. No, yeah, I was, I was, you know, just. I was slowly circling the drain, getting closer and closer. Indeed. Well, I I had forgotten that we need to keep these short if we're going to put out a ton. But December is the time when we'll really be struggling, right? Yeah, and we can keep them shorter as they go, too. It's uh, not a big whoop. Yeah, I, I was that, well, that was one thing I was thinking about, talking about, on the, was the title service with a smile. Seems like a weird title, but I guess not necessarily. I mean, it does at least give you the, uh, the like introing it, you know, because he goes to the gas station first, and you get the full serve, and and the guy seems sullen, and then all of a sudden he smiles, and then you go to the house, and I guess basically all the people are serving the old lady in the end, so the title works. All right. Well, I guess it's time to go to bed. Um, uh, I will get that file into... Oh, geez, I'm still recording. I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. 